My name is Joe Lombardo, and I'm the coordinator of UNAC, the United National Anti-War Coalition. Uh, you can find us at our website, which is unacpeace.org. Uh, we're also on YouTube at at UNAC, on Instagram at at UNAC Peace, on Facebook at End the Wars, uh, Twitter at UNAC One, um, and other locations. Those are the main ones. So today we're going to talk about Korea. Um, the Korean War was one of the bloodiest of the many wars that the U.S. has instigated. Uh, the armistice was signed, ending the fighting in um, July of 1953, but that stopped the fighting. However, the U.S. refused to sign a peace agreement to formally end the war. As far as the U.S. Con is concerned, the war is not over. The U.S. has stationed troops in South Korea ever since and holds annual military exercises with the South Korean military. Although the U.S. always claims that these are defensive, they are seen by many as practice invasions of the North. As the U.S. moves more military into Asia to surround and threaten China, this year's military exercises are one of the biggest ever. The right-wing president of South Korea, Yan Suk-yeol, recently visited the U.S. And while he was here, Biden announced that uh, the U.S. will send a nuclear sub to port in South Korea. Uh, the South Korean president also recently made threatening remarks about South Korea obtaining, possibly obtaining nuclear weapons. As the war in Ukraine continues, taking the lives of hundreds of thousands of soldiers, the U.S. is moving more forces and more bases to Asia and threatening another war with China. Our webinar tonight is going to discuss these issues. And we're first going to hear from Riley uh, Sung Yung Park, who is a doctoral student in clinical psychologists, psychology at the University of Indianapolis. He co-edited Socialist Education in Korea, Selected Writings of Kim Il-sung. Uh, Parks uh, is a member of the Noted Hall for Korean Community Development, a very important organization for Koreans in the United States. So I'm going to turn it over to Riley now. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I want to begin my remarks tonight with a story. A few weeks ago, members of Noroto, the June 15th US committee and, under, and other Korean peace activists marched in the rain from Grand Central Station to the UN. We marched to the South Korean and US missions with these demands. And the Korean War and the US South Korean Joint Military Alliance, we want peace and reunification now. Our march coincided with South Korean President Yoon Suk Yeol's historic visit to the US, where Yoon and Biden affirmed their commitment to the US South Korean Joint Military Alliance. In his in his address to Congress, Yoon thanked the U.S. for the role in the Korean War, reaffirmed the U.S.-South Korea-Japan trilateral alliance, and committed towards a mutual defense treaty under the Washington Declaration. Biden and Yoon are leading Korea towards war. This comes at a time where the US is expanding its militaristic reach, not only in Korea, but further into Asia and the Pacific. The joint South Korea US military ex exercises are one way that the US is trying to encircle China and North Korea and preparing for an all out war. Yoon's desperate attempts to form alliances with the US and Japan come at the expense of the Korean people. 
a couple months back, Yoon and Japanese Prime, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida decided to have Korean companies, not the Japanese government, pay Korean survivors of Japan's forced labor conscription during World War II. While survivors still plead for justice and reparations, Yoon is cozying up to Japan, letting Japan completely off the hook for its wartime crimes. Yoon is also committed to suppressing any opposition to his policies and his alliances with the US and Japan. In the last year, the National Intelligence Service had raided the Korean Confederation of Trade Unions and the Jeju 615 Committee. The 615 Committee was raided for showing a North Korean film. Even though the committee had received permission from the government's Ministry of Unification to show the film. Yoon's right-wing administration also has also intensely suppressed unions, worsened condition for workers, and slashed the minimum wage. Yoon himself ran on a campaign of misogyny and anti-feminism, vowing to, uh, to abolish the government's Ministry of Family and Gender Equality. Yoon is one of the most right-wing, anti-worker, pro-war presidents in recent South Korean history. And he has staunchly allied himself with the same imperialists who have kept Korea occupied and divided, the US and Japan. For over 70 years, the US has seen Korea as a key military base for US imperialism and domination in Asia. The US just deployed nuclear submarines to South Korea, putting not just Korea, but all of Asia at risk of nuclear war. This is not the first time that the US has ramped up aggression towards China and North Korea. Under US President Barack Obama, large scale terminal high altitude area defense or THAAD installations were built in Songju County. And a large naval base was built on Jeju Island, all at the expense of residents living in Songju and Jeju. US military bases in South Korea have poisoned Korea's groundwater made villagers sick with cancer and killed nearby residents with stray bullets. In the US's words, these military bases are there to quote unquote, protect South Korea and to quote unquote, deter North Korean aggression. But in reality, we can see that the US is the only aggressor in the region. The US, can and will do whatever it takes to secure its own interests in Northeast Asia. Finally, the US continues fighting the Korean war through economic sanctions. The US uses economic sanctions to isolate and bully any country that goes against the interests of the US or defies what the US wants the country to do. The US has heavily sanctioned North Korea for over 70 years. Nearly everything is sanctioned from paper clips and binders to water purifiers and x-ray machines. The list of banned items is long and expanding. The US blocks any sort of humanitarian aid going into the country and has also imposed a travel ban to North Korea since 2017. This means that no US citizens can travel to North Korea and that any Korean living in the United States who has family in the North cannot visit them. North Korea is not the only country that the US sanctions and isolates. Cuba has been under a brutal blockade for the last 64 years. Venezuela, Syria, Afghanistan, Iran, and others have also been hit with brutal sanctions from the US. 
The U.S. is the primary enemy of the Korean people. It is the U.S. who has kept, who has divided Korea, started the Korean War, and keeps Korea divided today. Yoon's attempts to cozy up to the U.S. and Japan are humiliating and enraging. Yoon does not represent the masses of Koreans. He represents an ongoing a long and ongoing legacy of Korean leaders who side with imperialists instead of the Korean people. In the US, Biden continues to drive the US war machine, using Yoon as a gateway into war with North Korea and China. These leaders do not represent us. It is up to us to build a strong anti-war and anti-imperialist movement here in the belly of the beast. For there to be truly peace in Korea, we must remove US troops and the US South Korean military alliance and defeat US imperialism in Korea and around the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Riley. Um, we'll have two other speakers, um, KJ No and Sarah Flounders. Um, and then uh, we will have uh, questions and discussion. If you have questions, the best place to put it is not in the chat because the uh, chat will um, disappear as it scrolls up. So I would uh, ask you to put it in the questions and answers, which you could find the question and answer icon on the bottom of your screen. So if you have questions for the speaker, speakers, uh, please uh, put it there. Uh, let me just also mention that UNAC will be doing another webinar on um, Friday. Uh, as you know, uh, Biden, President Biden left for um, Japan, where they will have a G7 meeting in, of all places, Hiroshima. Um, and there are a number of people from the United States and a number of people from around the world who are going there to protest, to do an alternative summit, and to hold demonstrations. Uh, one of them is uh, UNAC Administrative Committee uh, uh, member um, uh, who will be uh, also there. And she, will, she and others will be doing uh, a webinar from the rallies that are taking place this Friday evening at 7 p.m. And so I urge you to join us uh, there also. Um, when the Zoom information comes out uh, about, the, um, about this meeting with the link to the uh, video of this uh, particular webinar, I'll also put a link in there for that webinar if you would like to join us there. So now I'm going to introduce KJ No, who is a political analyst, educator, and journalist focusing on geopolitical and political economy of the Asian Asia Pacific. He writes for uh, Dissent Voices, Black Agenda Report, Asia Times, Counterpunch, LA Progressive, MR Online and uh, presents them. He also does frequent commentary and analysis on various news programs, including the Critical Hour, By Any Means Necessary, Fault Lines, Breakthrough News. He recently co-authored a peer review study of the military uh, transmission of infectious diseases and its implications for COVID transmission, and was a contributor to uh, the censored book, Capitalism, on a ventilator. Uh, that book was written by a number of people that um, number work work with uh, UNAC, and it was one of perhaps the only book that Amazon said it will not allow on its platform. Um, and uh, after uh, it started getting very good play in China, Amazon changed its mind, and now you can get that book on on Amazon, so it is no, long, no longer censored by Amazon. So let me um, give you AJ No. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, Riley, for a fantastic presentation. I'm going to start a little bit both in the current 
moment and in the history. And I'll give you a little bit of a slideshow. Said, uh, this is a little bit about uh, South Korea's uh, history, which I think is very relevant. And I also hope to uh, bring it into the current moment, which is to say that So I don't know if anybody recognizes uh, this family. Uh, I hope you do. Uh, this is the Cho family. It's a Korean family. And they were recently killed at the Allen Mall in Texas. The mother died protecting her child. Uh, you know, he she apparently covered uh, her son and uh, she herself was killed along with her husband. Uh, and her other son, uh, and apparently she was shot up beyond recognition. Uh, the uh, uh, parents identified her from her ring. <clears throat> uh, and of course, we can also think about the Atlanta spa shootings that happened not so long ago. Uh, these involved many, many Asians. Uh, four of them were Koreans. Uh, and of course, uh, at the time, the defense and the media said that the shooter was having a bad day. Okay. So my point is that Asians are no longer safe in the United States. And we have to ask ourselves, why? And my answer to that is really that they have never been safe. They've never been safe either in the United States or in their own countries. This, uh, of course, those of you who recognize this image will see this as the image of Gwangju. Today is the 44th anniversary of the Gwangju massacre. Uh, it's in, it's uh, May 18th in Korea right now. <clears throat> so those of you who know the history, and I apologize if you do, but I think it's important for us to go over this, it was, uh, a massive response to the military dictatorship of uh, Chun Doo-hwan, which took power after Park jang yi who was installed by the United States, was assassinated. Um, when students started to protest uh, against the new military government, uh, the Korean 7th Paratroop Special Warfare Brigade went in with tanks and armored personnel carriers, and they beat and clubbed and bayoneted and shot to death protesters. This is the original uh, protest at the university. You can see the paratroopers. You can see the mass protests. Uh, you can see the massive armor that was brought to bear. You can see the mass violence. Uh, and uh, Eventually, there was a massive reaction by all the citizens in the city. <clears throat> uh, this just brought on more uh, firepower. Tens of thousands of citizens faced off against 18,000 riot troops and 3,000 special warfare troops, and they essentially wrested back control of the city. Uh, this was not to last for long. Uh, the citizens reached out to the United States Embassy, asked them to mediate. The U.S. ignored the request, and instead they sent the aircraft carrier Coral Sea. They sent in AWACS, and they authorized the ROK 20th Division to invade Gwangju. On the 27th of May, 20,000 troops of the 20th Division, 31st Division, 7th Division, and third, special warfare brigades entered Guangzhou and massacred the civilians. <laughs> uh, we think that the death rate is somewhere between 200 and 2,500. It's still a point of contention uh, because they're missing bodies uh, and there's uh, some very, very poor record keeping. Uh, we think that many people were buried in unmarked graves we know that the excess deaths in Gwangju that month were 2,500. Uh, the Gwangju uh, weakened legitimacy for the Chun regime. 
But the key thing we have to understand is that the United States had operational control over all South Korean troops at the time of the Gwangju massacre. Uh, uh, More specifically, it had operational control. That is military command structure that cannot be abrogated. Now, the U.S. claims that it didn't know what was going on, that it was hopelessly enmeshed and entangled, but was really an innocent bystander that at the end of the day, Koreans killed Koreans and the U.S. didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, But it's really not plausible. This is an image of the lawmaker Kim Musong. He's giving a piggyback ride to the CFC commander, the US FK CFC commander. And this, I think, is you know, just a powerful metaphor for the relationship between South Korea and the United States. Uh, more specifically, the US CFC controls all South Korean troops. Uh, and Uh, There's been a concerted effort to have a whitewash over it. But as I said, uh, OPCON is military hierarchy. It's the structure. Uh, The U.S. knew about it. Uh, They were trying to avoid a second Iran. Uh, The ROK military was trained and coordinated by uh, the United States. And therefore, to say we didn't know what was happening or they weren't really under our control is similar to a pit bull owner saying that, you know, I took the pit bull off the leash and therefore we are not responsible. So uh, they also said the special warfare troops were uh, exempt from operational control at the time. And this, in my opinion, is a complete legal fiction. The special warfare troops are the most tightly integrated and coordinated with the US uh, military command. So uh, all of this is to say that South Koreans have never been safe on their own territory uh, because of a U.S. military control. Uh, we know also that there was the Bordeaux League massacres. These were massacres that involved perhaps 200, 300,000 people that were killed by the South Korean government under the control of the United States starting around 1949. Uh, Millions, uh, probably up to 1.2 million may have been slaughtered. Uh, There were so many people that were killed that they uh, dug up ditches upon miles and miles of trenches and buried people and shot them, buried them, shot them, buried them. Uh, They shot people uh, on the beach line and the Okinawa coastline was littered with corpses. The Japanese government lodged a formal complaint that corpses were washing up with Korean, uh, that beaches were washing up with Korean bodies 500 miles away. All of these were witnessed, facilitated, green-lighted by the US military. And so what we have to understand is that South Korea has always been a US colonial vassal state. When it was liberated from Japanese colonial rule in 1945, it created a Korean People's Republic anchored in people's committees. Uh, They started to administer the country. The US decided that this was not uh, permissible. They said this would allow communism to get off to a better start than anywhere else in the world. They outlawed the people's committees and the Korean People's Republic imprisoned its leaders. Uh, They banned the national unions, farmers unions, the labor unions, everything that was anti-colonial was outlawed and destroyed. And they reinstated a Japanese colonial rule. That is to say, all of the Koreans that had collaborated with the Japanese colonial forces, they put them back into power. It would be as if the Allies had liberated France and then put the Vichy government back into power. And they also crushed all resistance to uh, US rule and the rule of these Japanese former collaborators. So you can see that initially in October, 1946, they killed 300. 
And then soon they were killing people by the thousands. On Jeju Island, somewhere between 30 to 80,000 were killed. And then this crested over into the Korean War and the Porto League massacres, which resulted in the deaths. The Porto League massacres, as I said, somewhere between two and 300,000 slaughtered. And then the Korean War itself, three to four million. And so uh, simply the fact is that South Korea has been a quisling vassal state that has been subjected to vast atrocities, vast violence through its colonial occupation under US control. I think the key thing to take away for this is that South Korea was created through genocide to prevent socialism from taking root in Northeast Asia. And these genocides really have been, uh, you know, standard modus operandi for the United States and for the Imperial West. South Korea's massacres were a precursor to the politicide in Indonesia in 1964 and 1966. And the carpet bombing and the genocidal uh, massacres of the Korean War also prefigured the Vietnam War itself. The key thing here is that South Korea serves as a geostrategic bridgehead or a beachhead onto the Chinese continent. And the control of South Korea gives the United States free use of about 3.7 million uh, troops for kinetic war with China. So the the, the point that I want to emphasize is that operational control is one of the key stumbling blocks to South Korean sovereignty, South Korean liberation, and also reunification. South Korea gave away its operational control in 1950. It's never been returned. South Korea has had a military for 78 years. It has only had control over its own military for 13 months, that is to say, a little bit over a year in almost 80 years. The US pretends that it only has wartime operational control. That's like saying you only control the car when it's being driven. Militaries are built for war. If you control it during war, you control the military. And they've created a kind of a rule Goldberg legal structure that makes it look like South Korea has some sort of control over its military, but the US has wartime operational control, which it can get anytime it wants. And it has CODA, which is a kind of peacetime uh, planning cooperation of operational control. So the US is escalating toward China. The Korean Peninsula is key. The US is using a binding strategy. That is to say, it wants to corral and create coalitions and use proxies in its war against China. Uh, Korea and Taiwan have always been matched pairs in war. That is the case since 1592, uh, all the way up to the current moment, up to the Korean War, etc. They have always come up as matched pairs. The U.S. is escalating and trying to provoke a war in Taiwan over Taiwan province. Uh, they've essentially written a declaration of war, which has been uh, written into the National Defense Authoriz Authorization Act uh, called the Taiwan uh, Enhanced Resiliency Act. It's essentially a declaration of war against China over Taiwan. And of course, they're also escalating to the max over Korea because North Korea is a stalking horse. It's a pretext for escalation against China. Once again, uh, I cannot emphasize this enough. The U.S. has operational control over South Korean troops everywhere where the United States has gone to war. South Korean troops have accompanied the U.S. Uh, they have always been the first to go and the last to know. Vietnam alone, 350,000 rock troops where they committed incredible atrocities. And of course, you can see the tight control the United States had with various leaders. Chan Duan was the president who engaged, who uh, committed the Gwangju massacre, 
right after Guangzhou, he was uh, got a, uh, a high level meeting with Ronald Reagan. Park Chung Hee was the other uh, U.S. Uh, backed dictator. Uh, he was an imperial Japanese military officer, <laughs> but he was also very, very close to the U.S. leadership and did their bidding. Uh, Chun Duan attended the U.S. Psychological Warfare School. Uh, he went to Special Warfare School in Fort Bragg, Ranger School. Uh, this is him at Fort Benning. Uh, all of these South Korean dictators were trained and indoctrinated into U.S. military practices and culture, and they had very close personal connections with the U.S. military. The U.S. sees South Korea as the key threat multiplier. As I said, it was 3.7 million troops and bases and military material weapons that all fall under U.S. operational control the, the instant the U.S. decides that they want to use it. Um, uh, the key thing is that South Korea is a beachhead onto the Asian continent, and it always has been. Anytime there's been an invasion on the Asian continent onto China, it has always happened through Korea with uh, Taiwan province serving as the other uh, axis of uh, attack. It's usually come as a double envelopment. Uh, uh, my colleague and Korea expert Tim Beal argues that the most dangerous place in the Pacific, if not the world right now, is not the South China Sea or Taiwan province, but the Korean peninsula. The U.S. has drummed up a set of allies, that is to say Japan-Korea alliance, which is kind of a forced, brokered uh, shotgun wedding between uh, countries that otherwise would not have any relations. Uh, it has created AUKUS, which is Australia, UK, US, and they are using uh, Australia, Perth, but also creating a nuclear projection force all the way into the South China Sea and into the Pacific through AUKUS. Uh, NATO itself is going to come to Japan. South Korea already has relations with NATO through intelligence sharing, and there's a strong uh, uh, suspicion that essentially NATO will come into the Pacific, that it will simply extend itself into the Pacific. And of course, the Philippines is also being weaponized most recently by the reestablishment of uh, four additional bases in addition to the five that the U.S. already has. Uh, THAAD is a good example of uh, one of the ways in which the U.S. has militarized Korea in order to uh, escalate against China. It's designed for war with China. It's designed to shoot down missiles that reach 100, that go into the exosphere and then are shot down, ideally, at the 150 kilometer range. Of course, South Korea uh, is walking distance from the North Korean border. There's no reason why missiles would fly into the exosphere before coming down in South Korea. Uh, they wouldn't even have to, you know, I mean, they would essentially come in very, very low. And so we understand THAAD as uh, a, a weapon that is designed for war with China. Uh, Moon Jae-in, the previous president, opposed the importation of THAAD and the South Korea brought it in anyway. They ignored Moon Jae-in's uh, demands, brought it in. They didn't notify him. And then later when they were caught with the hardware, the South Korean military said that they could not tell the president of South Korea, the command, their commander in chief, because they had had a confidentiality agreement with the United States. I think that gives you a sense of how things work in South Korea. So anyway, uh, I think that's enough. Uh, the key point that I want to make is the United States is escalating to war against China. South Korea is the key force projection platform. North Korea is a stalking horse. South Korea and uh, Japan uh, will be doing uh, most of the proxy fighting. Uh, Taiwan is being readied as a suicide porcupine. They're currently strapping the suicide vest onto the people of Taiwan. And I think that the US is uh, 
as a failing hegemon uh, with no desire to give up its hegemony. It's willing to bet all its cards and it's willing to turn kinetic. And this is why we're at such an extraordinarily dangerous moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, KJ. Um, I'm going to try once again to get Sarah Flounders up. Um, so uh, just hang on for a minute. And hopefully we can do this. So um, Sarah Flounders is uh, the co-coordinator of the International Action Center and a member of the UNAC Administrative Committee. Uh, she is the author and editor and contributor to many books and articles, including the one um, that was mentioned in the introduction for KJ, uh, which was um, capital, uh, which was um, capitalism on a ventilator. Uh, presently, she's in China. Uh, she's um, actually right now at uh, Beijing Airport and uh, is not able to call into us, but she was able to send me her talk and a video. So I'm going to share that with you right now and uh, go from there. Okay, can you see this Sarah on the screen? Okay, well, let's just start this short video again, and um, uh, and then we'll proceed to questions afterwards. spend my few minutes uh, today praising the beautiful, modern, clean cities of China, the friendly reception, the events we've attended. But really, I want to talk about my overriding concern of U.S. war plans and what they mean, because this is a topic that is of greatest concern to the whole world and right here in China is there's uh, a feeling of what is the cause of this? What's driving this? Uh, where does this come from uh, after years of uh, development and exchange on a friendly basis? But the ominous U.S. war plans are so uh, intense and the uh, provocations, the hostility in the media uh, that it really has people around the world deeply, deeply concerned. Uh, so I'm joining you as part of UNAC's webinar with a very special message to urge anti-war forces in the US, to urge everyone who stands for social justice to prepare, to take this moment seriously, and to know that the US is planning a major war in Asia. We really need to wrap our head around this, prepare for it in every way, politically uh, rally ourselves in the most serious way. You may think it's not possible that this is off the charts to put life on the whole planet at risk in order to defend US dominance, but this is what the war makers are planning, war for profit, war for expanded military budgets, because that's immediately what keeps the US economy running. As sick as that may be, when we look at the military drills in South Korea directly threatening the Democratic People's Republic of Korea or North Korea, the uh, open use of Trident nuclear submarines, with separate missile launches, each with nuclear warheads, a floating death machine uh, announced into the harbors 
ports in South Korea. This is not the U.S. planning for peace. This is raising the stakes in a very ominous way. When we look at the new U.S. military bases in the Philippines, now nine bases in the real building stage, in complete violation of the Philippine Constitution, when we look at the increase in um, weapons and aircraft carriers in the Straits of Taiwan in violation of decades of signed U.S. agreements that Taiwan is part of China, that there would be Most urgently, when we consider the upcoming G7 meeting, what is this? It's a meeting of the major imperialist powers, meeting in, of all places, Hiroshima, the site of a city destroyed by a U.S. nuclear, one nuclear bomb, one launch, and consider what it would mean today, but also a city that has come, become synonymous with the opposition to nuclear weapons and nuclear war, to hold a G7 meeting in this location is a very ominous threat of a, an escalation that's happening in front of our very eyes. The election of right-wing governments in Taiwan, in South Korea, in the Philippines, and now the election of a new right-wing government in Thailand, open to all U.S. demands, we know that this is a very dangerous moment. Now, at the moment that you're hearing this message, I'll be flying to Urumqi in Xinjiang, also be in Kashgar. Now, everyone has heard the reports so continual from the U.S. claiming that there's a genocide in Xinjiang, China's most western province, the center of the vast transit network of the Belt and Road Program. And the claim is that there's a genocide going on in Xinjiang, that there's slave labor that's being used in the cotton fields of Xinjiang, which is the main major crop. And it's another part of U.S. complete provocation and lies because cotton production in Xinjiang is completely mechanized from the seeding and planting to the harvesting. It's completely machine driven. It's not people moving through cotton fields, hauling bags as it was for so long in the South. But that's the image they want to create in order to have a new threat so that now there's sanctions even on China's cotton production. This is how there's preparation for war on every level and we need to respond to it with facts, with images, with videos, with everything that we can to show that U.S. threats are escalating in the most serious way. Their military threats, their sanctions are growing, thousands of sanctions. We have to be prepared to answer all of these lies, all of these provocations, whether it has to do with Taiwan or Korea or the most immediate threats. We don't know what provocation, what new sanctions, what new congressional visit that comes with aircraft carriers off the coast and U.S. jet aircraft overhead, all claiming that China is threatening, whereas it's U.S. military that's right off their coast, directly threatening them and directly threatening the people of North Korea. We do know what is really threatening to U.S. imperialist power, and that's the ability of China to provide trillions of dollars in development funds to so many countries 
of Asia and Africa and Latin America, it means that developing countries have far more favorable trade relations without the IMF and the World Bank's onerous conditions. It means that countries can exchange with each other without the constant threat of their funds being seized, expropriated, and then they're sanctioned and they can't buy a simple aspirin even on the world market, battery or electronic parts on a world market. The sanctions, the military threats really heighten a sense of ominous and, and danger for the people of the world when the, what they want is trade and development. The ability of nations to develop in spite of the sanctions, which is what the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, North Korea, has shown it's possible to do under the most difficult conditions. This is threatening to US power, to dollar dominance, to the hegemony that the US has maintained for years. So it's a new day that could open great opportunity or reach a new level of military threat and possibly even war. So let's prepare in every way the material that we can. That's the purpose of my trip here to bring back both videos and reports of developments in China. But I do want to share the great concern here and the great concern that we should feel to oppose US wars, which are really also wars on working people in the United States today. We face a declining standard of living, declining health care, declining educational levels, all to fund an endless US war budget. So as we speak to each other today, as we speak to each other in a couple days at a webinar on the G7, let's prepare in every way that we can for to act together, to prepare material together, to speak to each other and to the people of the world, and to refuse U.S. war and sanctions and threats. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, thank you, Sarah, though she can't hear. Again, let me mention that Sarah Flounders is the co-coordinator of the International Action Center, a member of UNAC's Administrative Committee. Uh, she is the author, editor, contributor to many books and articles, and um, is speaking to us from China right now. So, um, I'm going to put up uh, our gallery view so you could see all of us, and um, we'll look at some of the questions. If you have questions, please put them in the question and answer area, and um, we'll see what uh, what we can ask. Um, uh, one question here is about the unification, uh, and it says, isn't there a danger that the DPRK will quote unquote, integrate um, into the Republic of Korea. Uh, uh, so in other words, it wants to, um, he's asking the question of why uh, progressive folks and people in um, Korea have uh, been calling for the reunification of Korea. What would like to answer that, uh, Riley or AJ? I'll take a quick stab at that. The key thing to understand is South Korea has been a unified country uh, since uh, for at least 1300 years on the peninsula. The majority, the vast majority of Korean families have, uh, South Koreans have family members in the North. Uh, as far as we're concerned, this was a division that was forced on us by the United States. A couple of uh, US officers went into a room with a National Geographic map and a ruler, and they split the country in half. And because of that, you know, millions of families were separated. And the next thing you knew, we were at war. 
What happens if North Korea and South Korea were to reunify? That is going to be a long and involved process. And it will start with probably some process of confederation uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, cultural exchanges, economic exchanges. You could also build out the railroad, which was prepared. There's kind of two strands of a railroad that were never connected, but are just waiting to be completed between North and South. And then I think eventually, I think the two countries will come together in some sort of meaningful political confederation. There are several obstacles to this. The key obstacle is the United States. The United States does not want reunification under any conditions. As I said before, the US needs North Korea as an enemy, as a pretext in order to uh, justify its presence, its military presence in the US, but more than that, also to justify its escalation against China and to monopolize control over Korean troops. Um, the other um, obstacle is the far right in South Korea that come out of the collaborator, Japanese collaborator class. And these are quizlings for US colonialism, US uh, imperialism in South Korea. And they are strongly, uh, almost vehemently uh, anti-North Korean, anti-communist. And so these are the two key obstacles that face us. And as I said, the first step for South Korea to recover its sovereignty is to wrest back operational control and then to stop the military exercises and then to de-escalate and then to go into a process of uh, negotiation and reconciliation with North Korea. I believe that can be done. We see ourselves as one country that was divided. Uh, we understand that you know, the forces of capitalism and imperialism are very, very powerful. But I think the North Koreans have their own sense of agency. I do not believe that they would allow themselves to be simply absorbed into uh, South Korean uh, polity uh, the way that East Germany was absorbed into uh, West Germany. I think that we have a completely different history. And I think that the vast majority of Koreans, both in the North and South, not only want reunification, but I think they believe that we can come to a meaningful uh, 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 co-resolution of these political issues that were forced down our throats by imperial powers. Riley, do you have any comment? Yes. Um, I guess I will add on, you know, um, again, like KJ said, you know, very different histories, very different material conditions from Germany and Korea. Um, like I said in my presentation that the U.S. Um, is the only aggressor in the region. And the fact that the U.S. has interest in that region, so they will again. They will do whatever it, 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 they can in order to secure those interests. That is why they have a such a media, such a strong media propaganda machine, especially when it comes to countries that they do not like or that defy them in any way. So they will run any sort of propaganda. Um, machine in order to justify these these you know sanctions these provocations uh, thank you I, I always remember a beautiful moment during the um japan olympics when there was a joint team between the north and south korea and they marched into the stadium together and the entire stadium stood up and cheered. I think the whole world understands these divisions that are artificially made um, all over the world for geopolitical reasons um, and uh, understand in their gut that they are wrong. Okay, another question is, how can we stop the uh, South Korea USA war games uh, that threaten North Korea. Anybody have any thought on that? Uh, KJ Riley, who would like to take that first? 
Well, I can say as an anti-war person, there is a way. And one of the key things to it is we have to build the anti-war movement. The anti-war movement in the past was able to bring millions into the streets and really affect the war effort. In fact, was one of the reasons affected the soldiers and the soldiers refused to fight in Vietnam. And um, it, it helped bring an end to that war. And it's that kind of movement that we must build in the United States um, and around the world. We saw the possibility of that when the US went into Iraq and millions came out in one city after the next on every continent of the world, even in the two populated areas of, um, uh, of the Antarctic, they, they did demonstrations against war. That's what people want. People want peace. They do not want war. Fortunately, we in the United States live in a country that has 20 times the number of foreign military bases as all other countries in the world and is involved in one military aggression after the next, and it must be stopped. That's my two cents. Either of you have something to say. Joe, I'll add to that. Uh, we have to think about peace and about anti-war activism, but I want to uh, point out two things. One is we have to think very, very concretely because I hear people making this kind of generic demand for peace on the peninsula. And I think that you really have to think in very specific, concrete terms. The first thing to understand is that South Korea is not a party to the armistice. This, the armistice was signed between North Korea and the United States and China. So South Korea isn't even a party to this armistice. And therefore, it doesn't really have a say on whether this gets transferred into a peace treaty or not. And so the peace that South Korea can actually claim, which it has a legal claim to, is to wrest back control over its own military. It has to wrest back OPCON, operational control of the South Korean military from the United States, which still holds OPCON to this day. And that is a US-South uh, Korea uh, negotiation that can be demanded. And of course, people in the United States can also urge this. The US has technically agreed to return OPCON. It's agreed to that for over a decade, going on you know, nearly two decades. Uh, and yet it always keeps on stonewalling and moving the goalposts. So that's the first thing. It has theoretically agreed to return OPCON. Once OPCON is returned, South Korea regains some measure of sovereignty and that from that measure of sovereignty, it can start to disengage from military exercises. Once it starts to disengage from military exercises, and these military exercises are the largest and most deadly on the planet. They involve 300,000 troops, uh, you know, larger than the D-Day Normandy landings. Uh, and so once you do that, uh, then you have uh, a pathway towards de-escalation and eventual peace and eventual reunification. I think the other thing that we have to think about is that we can't think about things in a too localized uh, perspective. You can't think small. In this situation, you actually have to think big. And the reason why the US is doing these war games and escalating uh, against North Korea is because it is planning for a war against China. That is to say, it's planning for World War III. And so what we have to do is in order to de-escalate on the Korean Peninsula, we actually have to prevent World War III itself. We have to think bigger, not smaller. And that means that we really have to put you know, our shoulder to the wheel and try and get the neocon hawks that are hell bent on hot war against China. These are the people that we have to call out, that we have to oppose, that we have to challenge, that we have to uh, prevent. Uh, this is the most urgent task. And I want to emphasize that we cannot think about Korea as a local issue. We really have to think of the entire Pacific and the entire global uh, escalation to war and to prevent it uh, uh, with, with every ounce of our being. Uh, I think that's the key thing. Okay, any other comment there? 
All right, let me ask this question, which is directed to you and simple. What did SAD stand for again, Riley? <laughs> SAD, I, um, I think, I think it meant THAD. I think I meant THAD. THAD. Okay. THAD. Uh, oh, he's yeah. saying THAD. Okay, I got it. THAD missiles. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, let's see what else is here. Um, are there any American political leaders, candidates that you think um, will advance peace initiatives in Korea? It's a kind of loaded question in some way, um, but let's just see if there's any comments. My thought is no, but <laughs> um, I think we have a political system that's uh, um, not geared towards democratic control and uh, I think we have two war parties, basically. But anybody else have a thought on that? Just a brief thought. You know, I'm listening to the platform of RFK, and he's talking about bringing back the troops, and he's talking about uh, demilitarizing. That sounds promising. Whether he can actually deliver, whether he'll be able to get anywhere near the White House is a question. And also, as you point out, Joe, the political process is so deeply, deeply corrupted in the United States that, you know, um, the I, I don't know to what extent we can depend or even put any hopes in any, uh, you know, candidates. But I say it's worth trying everything. It's not either or both. We have to do everything both. And I think uh, this is this is such an urgent moment that we are we are in that, you know, any way that we have of getting out an anti-war, anti-imperial message, uh, we should go with it. Okay. Um, there's a couple of general questions about propaganda, how much the U.S. population has fallen for the propaganda about China being an aggressor and so forth. Um, what's your thoughts on that and how can we counter that? Either of you. So, Sorry question. to kind of dominate the conversation, but right. the propaganda, we have to challenge it at its root. Uh, first, we have to understand the cause of the propaganda. You know, it has nothing to do with what China is or isn't doing. The US will concoct something out of nothing. Uh, you know, um, the, a pandemic is a Chinese virus. Uh, you know, a weather balloon is a Chinese attack or surveillance. So anything that comes out, they will turn it into some kind of anti-China uh, propaganda. But we have to cut it out at the root. First, we have to understand the purpose of this propaganda, which is to manufacture consent for war. It is, as I said, it is the pre-kinetic and the subkinetic dimension of war. Uh, so I think that's the first thing. The second thing is we have to decipher the language. So anytime you see specific types of language, you have to be able to do a translation into it. Anytime the US says that it is doing, uh, it's working to deter war in uh, Taiwan province, it's no, it's not deterrence. It's actually trying to provoke war. Anytime the US talks about security, in Asia, it's really talking about hegemony or force projection in Asia. So there's an entire glossary that you essentially create for yourself, and then you have to redecipher that language. And then once you have that, you should share that tool so that people can hear that language and they can immediately debunk it. The other thing is just to exercise basic critical thinking. Uh, you know, uh, does it make sense? You know, when you say that there is a genocide in Xinjiang. How is it possible that the population increases sixfold uh, and the life expectancy increases, uh, uh, increases by 35 years? How can you maintain that that is a genocide? So there's some basic things around common sense and critical thinking that we can apply. But the other thing to understand is the propaganda is coming so fierce 
and so relentlessly that it's easy just to get drowned in it. It's what the RAND Corporation calls the fire hose of falsehoods. Right now, we're being drenched in this fire hose of falsehoods, and it's really important for us to you know, resist it and at any point not take anything as given. Uh, exercise uh, critical judgment and uh, do not pass on anything, even as an assumption. Question everything that comes out of the mainstream media and the State Department. If you're not sure, just assume that it is propaganda and do your own research. I want to also say um, that there are attacks on people who give alternative narratives to the State Department right now that are severe attacks, like the attack on the uh, African People's Socialist Party. Um, they're being accused of being Russian propagandists because they have a different position than the State Department on Ukraine. Uh, there are There's the case uh, of um, uh, um, Julian Assange, who uh, pointed out the U.S. war crimes they want to put him in jail for 175 years, or Daniel Hale, a young uh, man who worked with uh, um, on the drone program and uh, saw that the drones were killing um, uh, civilians, not killing military people, and so he said so. And they told him, well, that's classified information. The U.S. tries to hide information like that from the people of the United States. And so they put him in jail for four years. Um, and more and more, we're starting to see this. Uh, we saw, have seen now in Britain and Germany that people who have taken positions that, that those governments don't like on Ukraine have had their finances frozen, their bank accounts taken from them. Um, there is a real attempt to uh, get people not to speak up against the government's positions. And so it's going to be a, a fight for us to um, be able to get the truth out, but it's something that, that we need to do. And I think objective conditions, while we try to bring out the truth, objective conditions will change um, people's feelings. And a lot of that right now is happening as the balance in the world hegemony is changing and what that will mean. You know, with U.S. capitalism, if they're going to continue to expand, will that mean that they will have to uh, pressure the American working class more? Will that cause a fight back? We see how the global South is refusing to go along with the sanctions on Russia because they see there is an alternative possibility. So we must keep the narrative going. We must keep the movement going. And in the context of the changing reality, I think we can build the kinds of movements that we need to do to, to uh, bring peace to the world. So I think we should probably leave it there. I know uh, AJ has a, another interview he has to get to. And but I think uh, uh, Joe, I'm 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 good. I just want to add a, a, a one more piece about the propaganda because I really believe this is one of the most important terrains of resistance and contestation. As I said, the war is already happening, and it's happening in a subkinetic dimension or a prekinetic dimension. That is to say, information war precedes shooting war. Right now, the U.S. is preparing for shooting war in the Pacific, and it's preparing the population, as it does uh, in order to manufacture consent, by uh, manufacturing this endless barrage of information warfare. This is how you're being prepared for war. And a couple of things that we have to notice is that, as you pointed out, Joe, anybody who speaks up will be tarred and attacked and they will be considered to be beyond the pale. And I think those of us who speak up have to be ready for that. We have to bring every ounce of moral courage that we have in order to debunk these lies because we know that we will be attacked, but that's just how it is. The second piece of this is that these lies will always play on your human emotions, on your compassion, on your empathy. That is why they talk about genocide. That is why they talk about slavery and cotton picking. All of these are very, very manipulative tropes that are already designed to trigger 
uh, a response in you. So be aware of the ways in which your hum humanity and compassion will be manipulated. It's happening right now as we speak. And the third thing to remember is what I refer to as Pascal's wager. When you hear something which is so absurd that it kind of intimidates you into believing it, you know, that the, you know, it's like a poker table. Somebody makes a bet, which is so large, you assume that they must have a good hand. The U.S. makes these extraordinary claims. And then people without even checking, they, well, they said it and it's so absurd. It must be true. <laughs> That's exactly the point when you have to disbelieve it because it is absurd. And the more absurd it is, the more they're preparing you for atrocities. The farther away we are from truth, the closer we are to war. Thank you. R Riley, do you have a comment? Yeah. Um, yeah, just to add on to that. Um, yeah, I think, I think, um, the, I think I said this before, but like the way that the U.S. wields its propaganda machine is very large. You know, we, we see this in, in time and time again, in any sort of, you know, war or conflict, there are, you know, organizations, there are media outlets that are paid by, you know, U.S. financiers, U.S. corporations to push out this propaganda. So what I would say to the point about like disseminating, you know, this sort of, or, um, dissecting this sort of propaganda, <clears throat> looking at the sources, getting down to the root, as KJ said, where are these sources, you know, reporting, you know, what, um, who are, you know, who are these, you know, media outlets or, you know, organizations being paid by? Um, you know, I think a lot of times when we, especially when it comes to North Korea, you know, there are reports coming from, um, you know, Radio Free Asia, which if you look at Radio Free Asia's um, funding, it's tied to a U.S. diplomacy arm corporation. So that's the that's the important thing about looking at the sources and getting down to the root. Who's financing it and what what is being pushed out in order to produce this sort of propaganda? So. Yep, I agree with you 100 percent. Well, Riley and KJ, thank you very much. And to Sarah, wherever you are, thank you also. Uh, I hope this was as enlightening to other folks as it was to me, this presentation. And um, I hope it helps us to take a step forward in the direction that we have to uh, move to fight for peace and to build the kind of movement uh, here and around the world. Uh, again, in 24 hours, you'll get something from Zoom. It will have a link to the video for this. I will try to, to get rid of some of the technical glitches that we had in that video. Um, I hope you all share that with everyone you can. and. Um, Hope you all have a good evening or morning, wherever you happen to be. Thank you.